the hair cells that are coated for for high pitch are located the most proximal to the eardrum so they're the ones that are getting the hit the first and the hardest and that's why you typically see high pitch hearing loss first from noise all right what is up everybody got a good one you're going to want to listen to today i repeat listen to if you can hear me so uh, well listen up. I've got Eric Barber to my right, Miss Haley Folks across from me, and also across from me, a real life audiologist and founder of Odo Pro Technologies, Grace Sturdivant. Grace, welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. This is welcome. awesome. It's been fantastic. You got here yesterday. We kind of hung out a little bit. We talked about a lot of things and actually like, you know, you can't help but ask questions. So I always feel like we're pre-podcasting and yeah. then- I actually rewrite down what we talked about, so I've got my I've got my notes here yeah. as I generally do. Always got the printouts. No, this is awesome. I've already had a great time. Yeah, it's a blast. This is like you making the trip is, and we've done we've uh, done some science. That's what we were just talking about. You, you just did a test, Mark. I just took a test. It's been a while <laughs> since I've taken a test. <laughs> Looking at the results, I don't know if I passed. I don't think you did. Uh, should we get it? Okay. Should we have Grace introduce herself? Yes. And let's then do that, Grace. So. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you and uh, a, a little bit what you have going on with Oda Pro Technologies, and then we're going to jump into the test. We're going to tease the test. It's like okay. A, it's like a so I'll give you the short version, and you can flesh it out as you want to okay. as we go. So I'm Grace Sturdivant. I hail from Jackson, Mississippi, born and bred in Mississippi, the daughter of an avid outdoorsman who hunts everything, uh, and so grew up around that with a very healthy respect for uh, the hunting sports and the conservationist efforts of, of hunters. My dad, you know, was very active with Ducks Unlimited and things like that. So I come from that background and then I entered the academic medical space as an audiologist diagnosing and treating hearing loss. And once there, you know, my, my clinical niche developed to be working with adults. And most of the time, the hearing losses that I was treating in clinic were largely preventable. Um, then I got into some research. I was on a study out of Johns Hopkins looking at dementia and hearing loss and the negative synergy between the two and whether hearing aid intervention could delay the onset or slow the decline. And, and all the while, the medical community and especially the audiology community is preaching, okay, so what we need to do is treat early with hearing loss, diagnose the hearing loss, and then get hearing aids on that person to re-stimulate the brain, which sounds great. But to me... I felt very compelled to prevent the problem, to get out in front of it, to meet people where they are. And I noticed something. My own father that I mentioned, who needs good hearing protection, would not make an appointment to come sit in a doctor's office to get his ears molded. Just wasn't going to do it. And so I started Odo Pro truly as a passion project that I thought would just be this little side thing I do on the side so that my friends and family could have access to great quality products. So I started researching everything out there and figuring out what do I want my dad to have. And we went to his house after work. We sat there and hung out while I molded his ears, sat at the kitchen table, and then ordered stuff for him that he got in the mail two weeks later. And that's exactly the same model we have today. It's extremely personal. Um, word has word just spread. I mean, that was fall of 2018. Um, I had no intentions of building a national, or really at this point, international client base. But that service delivery model was so needed. Because not only do you need the service of getting your ears molded and placing the, the initial order, but with these products, there's some, some service that needs to come along with that after that purchase. Right. Um, we consider ourselves your hearing health coach from, from the time we meet you until whenever. I mean, honestly, we want to follow up with you, make sure that, that you have what you need, that it's working appropriately, that your questions are answered. Um, so uh, we're still at our core, a customer service company and we're not tied to one brand or manufacturer. It's very individual. That's why on these podcasts, I don't talk a whole lot about product specific things because that is subject to change as technology evolves so rapidly in this space. Our job is to motivate people to protect their hearing and provide that education and then provide the most realistic products that you will actually use to protect your hearing when you're doing what you love to do. 
Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, what um, you mentioned uh, a couple things there, like, you know, like this super personalized service. And I would say that's, I would venture to guess, like that is a huge component of your, your growth. Just that, you know, cause mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're providing an experience right. that people are like, that they're actually want to talk about. They're like, oh, well, you know, I got this, I got this product. It was amazing. I got, you know, really great help with it. And right. I just, I'd have to think that that actually is like, you're providing a great product as well, but the catalyst is like, you know. Right. We are very picky with, with what products we will dispense to people uh, because we only want to put really quality things into this space uh we take it very seriously uh but at the same time it's a whole lot of fun when it's more personal when i can get to know you and when you tell me this about this cool hunting trip and what you need to hear and what you need to be protected from and what kind of audio plug-in you need if you need one um it's a lot of fun to get to know people in this outdoor space you guys are doing really cool amazing things and it's been very interesting to get to know people i was glad um I've gotten into the sporting clay community and back home in Mississippi, we hosted a a big regional shoot recently and it, it was, it just feels like you're with a bunch of friends at a tailgate, honestly, uh, because of the community that we're growing with our Odo pro clients. And I was able, (laughs) people call me crazy, but I just invited all of my clients that were in town for that shoot to come over and we had a barbecue at the house and just had a great hangout time. It just felt like a bunch of friends hanging out because we truly have gotten to know each other through this personal process and everybody's not everybody needs the same product so it's not just a product transaction and we're done with you yeah right that, that's kind of what we were when you were taking the test mark we were chatting a little precast and uh so i had had custom molds back in high school i used to shoot competitive sporting clays and lost one of them so like for the last like probably 10 years i've just been like using you know basic ear molds and just like, you know, the, the cheap stuff you buy at the sporting goods store. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, that's worked out great, but like back to what you said with like the service model, like I think what you mentioned is like, if, if roles were reverse and I lost one of mine that, you know, you did here for me today, like you have those molds on file, you can call at any time. Hey, I lost my right ear, whatever, and get one rebuilt oh exactly i mean you shoot us a text or an email you call us you send us a dm i mean there's Mm -hmm. a million ways to get in touch with us these days and you say hey i lost my left one and we'll just uh, we can shoot you an invoice for a single unit and we already have your scanned impression of your ear and we get it going and you'll get it in the mail as soon as possible same thing with repairs if something breaks um we never want you to have to call like an 800 number and leave a message and yeah. try to f- you know no like you let us know what's going on we're the intermediary between you and the manufacturer so we send you a repair form and a prepaid shipping label so you can just drop it in the mail and we facilitate the whole process for you well and that's awesome. like yesterday watching you mold our vortex employees mm-hmm. and like just that c- personal experience like I think it makes people feel more comfortable especially like you're talking to them and it's like well I feel good that I know Grace now she's yeah. somebody one I'm talking to mm-hmm. she's gonna help me and like it is a bigger purchase for a lot of people right so sure. it's like you make people feel comfortable that this is a good investment and they're not going to be left out like high and dry exactly something they don't want. Um, and, and I, I'm very aware of the fact that for some people the cost is nothing for yeah. most people the cost is a serious consideration and so I, I never want it to be like a high pressure I'm not a I'm a great audiologist I'm really not a salesperson and I want it to be a low risk situation and I want to find what's what suits you your lifestyle your budget your needs and so um, I, I tell people I'm like you know with with the custom purchases, we have a professional fee that's 75 bucks. That's the only part that's non-refundable. So that's your risk right there. Um, and, and we're going to do the right thing at the end of the day. I mean, like when something's born out of a passion project, this was not a business plan. Right. Sure. So uh, there's still no business plan. Yeah. <laughs> we probably need one. Yeah. But, uh, but truly it's like, we're, we want to, I'm very committed to having a hundred percent customer satisfaction. Even if that means I've just taught you how to use a foam earplug correctly at the end right. of the day. Mm-hmm. Right. Which I, I mean, there's actually something to that too. Like yeah. Yeah. a lot of people are, are even, you know, at that level using those in, incorrectly, uh, myself included. Right. right? Mm-hmm. But one thing, you know, you're talking about the molds yesterday and, and like the questions that you're asking, you know, uh, from what I could tell, like, it's like, yes, you're building relationship, you're getting that rapport, but all your questions are, are, or not all of them, but a lot of them are geared towards like, okay, what are you doing? What are your needs? You know, so you, 
you can help them get the best product that's right for them. Yes. You know, I typically start with asking people, okay, what do you use currently? Um, do you like it? What do you like? What do you not like about it? What do you wish it could do? And and I'm brainstorming during that conversation of, of trying to think of what products are out there that would best suit that person. And that's typically how it goes. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and taking all that into consideration. And, you know, when I'm not the one that's able to mold you, we can still guide you through that selection process if you're not sure when you go to our website what you need. Um, and then when, when you purchase through the website, um, that's when, if we don't already have a provider set up in your area, your purchase is what puts you in our queue to find the very best clinic to get your ears molded. And we facilitate that whole set up so that when you go to that clinic they they know your name they know what you're coming in for they know what you need we know exactly what that clinic charges for the service of making your ear mold impressions and it works better for everyone for us to facilitate that that's why when you go to our provider locator all you really see is city and state because when we put the the clinic information out there and the clinic and the clinic gets a call from a person it can just be a little clunkier we want to make sure that everything is as smooth as possible like truly kind of rolling out the red carpet for everyone to make it as easy and simple um and we prefer to facilitate that for people sure yeah yeah what about so how i kind of want to backtrack a little bit because like um audiology super cool Mm mm-hmm how did you, like, what made you want to get into that? Well, you know, it took me a while to land on it. And I'm so thankful to have found something that I am truly passionate about to my core. Um, and hindsight's twenty twenty. I feel like all my life experiences has led me to the center of the Venn diagram where, like, what I love, what I know, what I'm good at have all found its place in the center. And that's what I wish for my children, right? So I grew up, I've always loved music. Um, and communication. My nickname in preschool was Chatterbox. You know, (laughs) I mean, like, I just, I I love communicating with people and connecting with people. Um, I've said before, I feel like I experienced the world largely through my ears. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether it's, you know, getting to know you personally and and communicating that way, whether it's music, uh, my life kind of, I feel like there's a soundtrack for everything, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I'm, I'm, I became fascinated through studying the anatomy and physiology of how we hear with our brains. I thought I wanted to be a speech language pathologist like my mom, um, which seemed like a great course for me, a great path for me too. But in those classes, I took, you have to take some audiology classes as they're very related. And I became so fascinated with how we hear and how it's processed and what the brain is doing to explain what we hear. Um, and I was just hooked uh, the final, the, the, the final deciding factor was when I watched a documentary about a child that received a cochlear implant and she was born deaf to hearing parents, which is in vast majority of the cases, that's how it goes. And so, um, the child had, had, had the surgery to place the implant after being born deaf. And then a couple of weeks later, she sits with the audiologist to do the activation, to turn it on. There's a lot of programming that goes involved into that, that the audiologist does. And um, the parents were standing behind the child. The audiologist is about to turn everything on and she tells everyone in the room to be quiet. And then she says, okay, mom, I want you to say her name. Ugh. Uh, right? I, I know. I've wow. seen this I know. Before. And so can you imagine this baby that you've been rocking yeah. and, and I mean, I sang to my babies in the rocking mm-hmm. chair yeah. and talked yeah. to them constantly. And I can't imagine if I knew that they couldn't hear that. Wow. And so then this child is sitting there and she has no meaning attached to that sound at all. Yeah. But the mom says her name and the child's head like whips around. And of course, everybody's like crying. The mom is like, oh, my baby heard me. I mean, Ugh. and no, I'm not crying. <laughs> <laughs> You're crying. But that's when, you know, the audiologist is the one yeah. that got to do that moment. Sure. That got and, and that gets to have that relationship with that family to then work with that child and make sure that as she grows, they're continuing to program this implant so that she can learn to hear and speak and and develop speech and language at like a normal kid. How would they like I'm thinking about that as like a baby, right? Like how long does it take for you to realize like if you have a baby and they can't hear you cuz they can't like voice that. Well, so we, like, now have, we now have we now have mandatory newborn hearing screenings. Oh, okay. So when you have a baby, they test the hearing in the hospital. Okay. Um they do a screening and if you fail that, they have you come back and do another screening. Sometimes there can be a lot of fluid residual from just the birth process that needs to clear uh particularly in C-sections cuz you don't get like the 
I'm sorry, I don't want to get graphic, <laughs> but it gets suctioned out when it happens the other way. <laughs> and so um, anyway, sometimes you have to let that clear. But then we, um, as audiologists, we are trained in electrophysiology. So with that, we can do an auditory brainstem response test where we attach electrodes to the baby's head. Um, and then while they're sleeping, we play a bunch of clicks in their ears, essentially. And we're looking for a certain like wave five sure. on the brainstem. Wow. And we can track how how quietly can we play this click and still get that response from the brain stem. Interesting. And so um, that's really the gold standard. We can do that while the baby is naturally sleeping. And then if we have to, with older kids, we will do it with sedation in the operating room. But it's not a surgery. It's just electrodes attached to the head with the clicks. But we have to have you in a very uh, sleep sleeping state so that we can get just those responses from your brain stem to sound. It's interesting that, yeah, like you're, I mean, I guess like, yeah, you're, whether you're sleeping or awake like your brain is like active but mm-hmm. like it's like actively listening even though maybe you're less aware that you're listening yeah. i don't know right like, yeah. right uh-huh and it just sounds like a hmm. to the baby so it's not yeah. gonna like wake them up right yeah. right but um but yeah so we that's how we measure babies hearing definitively um and then we if we know there's a profound hearing loss and that a, a an implant is going to be able to give that child access to sound, then we implant, we, the audiologist doesn't do the surgery. Typically it's an ear, nose and throat doctor that does the surgery where we implant um, an electrode array into the cochlea, which is that snail shell, two and a half turns, looks like a little snail. Um, But we put an electrode in there where you would normally have functioning hair cells that send the signal to the brain. We then have electrodes in there that can send a signal to the brain. And then the child wears a processor that looks like a big hearing aid. And then there's a little piece that attaches magnetically to the inside portion to, de- to detect the sound that's going on around, around the child. Then deliver the sound to the internal electrode, which then sends those po- action potentials to the brain. Crazy. Wow. So it's truly like implanting. Yeah. Yeah. Unreal. Kind I mean, of crazy. Like hearing you tell that story, number one, just like an amazing story, and like totally, like you know, I have kids. Like yeah. even if you don't have kids, like you can just just hearing that and how special of a moment and impactful that is for that mom, for the child. Mm-hmm. You know, another way for them to communicate and bond that wasn't there before. Right, and it actually makes me feel like guilty in a way that I've taken my hearing for granted gonna, so yeah. much and just be like, yeah, I'll sh- uh, you know, I don't have hearing protection. Boom. You know, I want right. to shoot that deer. Right. Yeah. And doing that damage. And then, you know, I don't know, like, it's just like take it. I, I realized that I've been really taking that for granted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday, but how it's almost like a, a generational thing. Like, you know, when you're describing your dad, I'm like seeing parallels to my dad, you know, like he is 65, just got hearing aids for the first time. We've been telling him for 10 years. He's a carpenter, avid yeah. outdoorsman. So he's around power tools and, you know, shotguns all the time. Like he's always around. Loud he noises. and my dad would get along fabulously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we've always been on him to get, you know, hearing aids and he finally did it. And like the first time that I took him it was, we were on a hunting trip last year and we were, uh, uh, floating down like this river and he made a comment how he could hear water hitting the side of the canoe. And I'm like, to me, that's just something that you take so for granted. Um, another example, I was on the phone with him one spring and I'm like, man, the, it sounds like the birds are back. Cause he lives in Northern Wisconsin. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, dad, I'm, I can hear the blue Jays through the phone and you are there in person and you can't hear that. And it's just those small little things. Oh yeah. Think about not being able to hear that. Like that's oh, horrible. Totally. I know. That, it's a, I mean, uh, maybe there's some listeners that'll go into the field of audiology. I mean, it's right. like to motivate people to get into this field. It's been so rewarding. I mean, my hearing aid patients would bring me stories like that. They would come back for a follow up and they'd say, I didn't realize when I was out for my morning walk that I was supposed to be hearing the gravel under my feet and the birds in the trees. Um, it's really cool. You know, you see these great videos of people who are colorblind, who get those glasses and then they're able to see color. I mean, it's very analogous to that with your ears. You don't, you don't know, you don't realize what you're missing a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about my childhood as we were talking yesterday and about like, you're always taught to put your seatbelt on and a bike helmet and all these things. And we, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like hearing protection was as much as a stress as like some of the others 
no. safety yeah. things, which mm-hmm. I don't I don't know why. But it's we just would like, go spend the weekend. You know, we, we would go out to dad's hunting camp. You know, we'd be riding four wheelers all day. I guess you call them ATVs up here. We call them four wheelers. In four wheelers. <laughs> four wheelers. We even had a three wheeler mm-hmm. uh, before there was a four wheeler. That was real safe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'd ride all day. We, would you know, shooting guns, stopping to shoot whatever and then um you know and then we're hanging out that afternoon i mean it's constant noise my dad loved a chainsaw i mean he'd get out there you know it's cutting down trees with a chainsaw um and no thought right. no thought of hearing protection it just wasn't part of the vernacular and i really don't fault our parents generation for that um i mean, you know we've come a long way they didn't smoke cigarettes when they were pregnant Right. I guess. Most, uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Mom and dad. So, <laughs> Chime in. Comment below. But you know, it, it's kind of like all these things through throughout, you know. I mean, sunscreen, yeah. seat belts, bike helmets, the whole, you know. It's true. Uh, you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, exactly. I think part you mentioned earlier, you brought up, you know, you said ease of use, right? Right. And I think part of that is like the options that are available now. Yeah versus then you know like oh, yeah. i was like am i going to carry a big set of muffs in the field exactly well, then i, I want to be able to hear the deer coming or i, I want to hear the turkey gobble and then all of a sudden you know so i'm not gonna have my muffs on then i'll put them i'll put my hearing protection you know at the moment of truth well that happens pretty quick you're like forget it i'm gonna shoot yep. and then off you right. go yeah or then like duck hunters are such a great example because it's so social and mm-hmm. you know you're hanging out you're all together. Everybody's talking, conversing. You you don't want to be wearing earplugs no. during that. When you usually think you have more time because you're like, I'll see the birds coming and I'll have a second to throw them in before they get close enough. Not happening. The number of people who've told me stories of totally getting their bell rung because they were having a conversation. All of a sudden, somebody yeah. pulls up and shoots right next to them. Ugh. Um, and that's just the way it goes. So my uh, a lot of people don't realize that there are so many options that allow you to hear and be protected instantaneously. Exactly. So I, I want to put people into products that they can put on, get used to it, because it's it's going to have to become a new normal. So you got to get over that. But you put them in, and then you go about your outdoors adventure, and you've just got them in already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the best compliment is when, like if I'm at a sporting place tournament, and somebody walks up, and you can tell they've been done shooting for a while, but they haven't thought to take their earplugs out yet, because they forgot about them. Exactly. That's exactly what I want to happen. Yeah. We, we kind of talked about this a little bit too, um, how, you know, back to the new normal thing when it comes to like, hey, this is just the way you need to think about your, you know, gear that you're bringing to your, your sporting clays match or bringing right. duck hunting, whatever. You know, it's not too long ago that all of a sudden people started bringing med kits, mm-hmm. you know, on like, I mean, I remember what, we did a podcast with DJ Strunz a couple yep, of years North ago. North American Rescue. Yep. yep. And that was really the first time that I ever gave any thought to bringing like a tourniquet in my deer hunting backpack right. when I'm like hunting Southwest Wisconsin. You know, it's like, what, what, what can happen? But then you kind of learn about, hey, here's, you know, the resources available. They don't take up a lot of weight. Next thing you know, I'm packing around a little like stop the bleed kit. Same thing here. Like, we're, we're getting better as a, uh, you know, from the resources that people have available. Mm-hmm. And now you're getting guys that are leaving their hearing protection in at long after they're done shooting. Mm-hmm. And it's just redefining like, Hey, this is something that I need mm-hmm. and this is why. So yeah. I think, yeah, that's kind of the, the way of looking at it is, yep. you know, the, the more it becomes habit, the better off you're going to be. It seems like some of that stuff too, like for, for whatever reason, like, you know, historically in the past, like it was almost like, um, if you were to like an attack on your masculinity, yeah. like, Oh, you're not man mm-hmm. enough to, you know, tough not, guy, taboo. Not, yeah. Tough guy, taboo. Exactly. Yeah. You know? And, uh, it's, it's just cool to see that shift. And, but and those tough guys that still kind of carry along that, that, that macho factor, yep. they're now bringing their grandkids up to me and saying, but what can we do to, to protect his hearing? Exactly. Cause I don't want him to end up like me. Mm-hmm. So even if, even if, someone is really resistant i'm very i'm very optimistic about the future of where this is going because the conversation i've been so pleasantly surprised at how eager people are to talk about this once they realize what i'm doing and even if they're one of those people that's not interested in spending a dime on hearing protection for themselves they're very interested in what they can do for the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of one of those things where like, you don't really appreciate it until you've kind of lost some of that ability to hear. Um, even, you know, Mark, and we'll get to the, you you know, your, your exam, your test. Um, but like even just watching you go through that, that test, it's like, you know, I, I want to, I'm sure I'm right on your footsteps, you know, cause doing a lot of the same stuff 
for the generally speaking, like not really prioritizing hearing. So it's like, what can I do now to hopefully like not have, you know, that, that same kind of, it, yeah. you know, At test least, results. Well, oh, so you're trying to be better than Mark. What can yeah. I do to not yeah, be yeah, like Eric's Mark very competitive. <laughs> Mark, he's going to like, he's gonna, if he takes that test, he's going to be like, well, maybe I can hear this. Yeah. <laughs> yes. A, but, bunch uh, of, a bunch of false positives. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I can uh, hear it. Yeah. Fudge the results. Yeah. She, she, Grace can be like, mm, it appears you are superhuman. Uh. <laughs> but, you know, when you're talking about what can I do. Right. Um, one thing I really like to give as an example is sun exposure. Hearing loss over time is a lot like sun exposure. It's cumulative. So the number of times that I got sunburns as a kid, mm-hmm. either from baking in the sun, trying to get that bronze tan, or... Oh my goodness, I look back, talking about things you don't know. The time I spent in a tanning bed in the 90s. I mean, ooh, if I could take that back. Yeah. Um, but I did. And, and you know, you, you might get a little sunburned, but then the sunburn goes away and your skin still looks beautiful and youthful because you're young and, it you know, you recover. Well... That we know we know that that was doing damage that I'm now seeing as I'm rapidly knocking on 40s door and um, you know now I'm spending over I'm buying overpriced eye creams and serums and you know trying to reverse the crow's feet and the sunspots and all that stuff um, but it, because it catches up with you and you're weakening that system over time same thing with noise exposure you go to some concerts or really loud bars with live music in college you're, you go home your ears are ringing you don't know if it's from the beer or the music yeah. and, <laughs> Probably both. And, and your head's kind of swimming and you're in, and you know it, your ears might even ring the next day if it's been a, 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 a really loud place but then it goes away and you think oh okay I'm fine I'm fine well that was still weakening the hair cells that I was explaining that send the sound to the brain those hair cells get weakened and they'll recover a certain number of times and then they can't recover again. And that's when the hearing loss starts to set up. And it's typically those high pitches that get hit first from the noise because the hair cells that are coated for, for high pitch are located the most proximal to the eardrum. So they're the ones that are getting the hit the first and the hardest. And that's why you typically see high pitch hearing loss first from noise. And then it gradually moves down the cochlea to be more across the whole frequency range. Gotcha. That's so interesting because what it was like just last week, we were talking about a high frequency noise that we were, you know, we were picking up. I forget what we were doing, but yeah, we, we, uh, we could hear like several of us could hear like a high frequency noise. Mm Mm-hmm. I wasn't able to hear it as good as like Maggie and Catherine were, and you couldn't hear it at all. Yeah. So I, like, I mean, what it's noise? exactly. So it's totally supports what you're talking about. Oh there. yeah. So many people tell me that uh, their their spouse maybe can hear the coffee pot yeah. like beep when it's ready, uh, but they can't ever hear it. Um, like beeps and and like the microwave. Sometimes the microwave is at a pitch where people just cannot hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very interesting to see that happen. But that's exactly what it is: is the hair cells at that pitch have been damaged, and so there's nothing to trigger the brain that there's a sound there. So maybe, so maybe you've you've, you've already covered a lot of this. But like, so how, like how, and maybe you've covered it in completion. I don't know. But like, how is the human ear? like working, like start to finish? Yeah. Or how is it perceiving sound? Absolutely. I, I would love to walk you through that. I mean, I'm such a dork about this. It's just, it's strange, I know, but bear with <laughs> me. So, you know, the sound waves are all around us. They're in the air. They travel through the air, these sound waves. They come through our ear canals, which your your ear is just the transducer. It's like the funnel to capture what's going on around you. And the, the size and shape is on purpose to try to help us hear. It's amazing the way our ears, the way God designed them is just mind blowing. So sound waves come into the ear canal. They hit your eardrum, which vibrates. And that vibration moves the three smallest bones of your body, the ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes are these three tiny bones that are connected to each other and form like this vibration chain through your middle ear space between your eardrum and your organ of hearing, the the cochlea. And so um, sometimes fluid can build up with an ear infection behind that space, which then slows down that vibration, which makes your hearing feel more muffled when you have a bad ear infection. Anyway, so the vibration of the ossicles happens, which then moves the ossicles in and out of the cochlea. And the cochlea, that snail-shaped portion, is filled with fluid. And so that vibration sets that fluid in motion. That fluid moves the hair cells that are along the membrane in that cochlea 
And as the hair cells move, they trigger an action potential, which travels up the brainstem to be processed in the opposite temporal lobe. So on the side of your head, the auditory cortex on the opposite side is, is then processing the sound. And in the same way that I was saying those hair cells, if you were to roll out the cochlea, it would, it would be from treble down to bass. Okay. As you move down the cochlea. That's yep. what I was saying. The, hair, the high pitch hair cells get, get sent first. So um, the, the, the auditory cortex in your brain that's processing that stimulation is also coded for pitch. So there are certain regions along that cochlea where from treble to bass, it's processing that incoming sound. And then, of course, attaching meaning to it as you learn language and all of that. So when, when those, let's just take, for example, the high pitch region. Let's right. say those hair cells are damaged. Well, the high pitch coding region in your temporal lobe is not being stimulated. Oh, my gosh. Interesting. Yeah. So that's, that's where a lot of this research I was involved in comes in. So what happens when an area of the brain is not stimulated? Well, when the rest of your cochlea is pretty good, oftentimes it triggers a ringing. Okay. Because your brain, that portion of your brain is seeking a sound that's not coming. So I, I relate it to a phantom limb syndrome. Somebody loses an arm and feels pain in an arm that's not there. That's your brain searching. It's, it's, it's like, hey, I'm supposed to be getting input from this body part and it's not coming. So it triggers this like phantom sound. That's, that's oftentimes where tinnitus come from, comes from, which we can talk a lot more about that. That's a whole topic, probably a whole podcast yeah. of itself. Oh, yeah. But so um, what we're doing with hearing aids is then pushing sound into those specific regions where you're lacking the stimulation and providing that stimulation back to the brain. I, I guess I didn't realize that. I assumed that that was just like the tinnitus, which I've always called it tinnitus. Someone called it tinnitus from now on. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll even like act smart and correct people. Like, yeah. let me just stop you right yeah. there. It's tinnitus. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but uh, I assumed that that was like from, I mean, it is from the damage, but I didn't realize how or why the sound right. was occurring, mm -hmm. which I have, I mean, like I've got a pretty constant high pitched wee and actually when it's really quiet out is when I notice it the most. I'm like, whoa, that's actually pretty bad. When it's there's like constant? enough noise in the room. Oh, yeah, always. Left ear. Just Do you have that too? No, down. but, oh. but I, I get it after, like, if I go duck hunting, like, I, I'll have it for the next day. It comes back, which is where I'm wondering if I'm like, that's why when I said I'm kind of like walking in Mark's boot steps here, like, mm -hmm. same lifestyle, same, like, probably lack of awareness when it comes to hearing protection and proactive measures. So, you know, like, I feel like we're kind of trending down the same path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, I don't have it that bad. I definitely had a couple major events. I mean, we're talking about even muzzle breaks today, you know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I think I'm good. I think I'm off the muzzle break, right? I'm bringing uh, it. So you're going to want to yeah, use your, I'm going to put those yeah. bad boys in. <laughs> uh, but so I was, uh, ended up, uh, I was shooting at a deer, had a, a gun, uh, uh, an auto loader with a muzzle brake on it, the Browning boss system back when that was like kind of a thing. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that actually directs the noise like through some sort of like uh, apparatus directly into your eardrum. Yep. Ended up shooting five times, got the deer. We got him, got him, everybody. But uh, for like three <laughs> days afterwards, yeah. like I would turn on the sink and I'm like, like nothing sounded yeah. right for like three days. Like it wasn't like it was. Um, I didn't know if my hearing was going to come back, mm -hmm. which it did. I'm glad it did, uh, yeah. but it might not next happen? time. Right. Right. Yeah. How old were you at that point? At that oh, one. gosh. So that one, I was in high school. Oh. Maybe, yeah. That's no, kind of scary. Might have been. Nope. I was in uh, like probably like a sophomore in college. That is kind of scary. Yeah. So, so we call that temporary threshold shift. When, um, when your hearing goes down for a period of time and then it comes back. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's exactly what I'm talking about, where if you picture these hair cell fibers in the cochlea that, that get kind of blown over by this sound pressure that's coming through. And then, you know, gradually, you know, there's a recovery time. That's also why it's very important. This Here's some practical hot tip. Um, if you've had a really loud experience, if you've been, if there's been live music or if you've had this big hunting thing and your ears are ringing and, you know, get into a quiet place, give your ears time in quiet 
to let them try to recover. Because those metabolic processes, I mean, you're, you're, um, you, you want to go home and let your ears truly rest from noise. Wow. But yeah. I like, as you're kind of describing that, I'm almost thinking like a recovery process from like, mm-hmm. you know, your muscles, like a workout, like, is that yeah. the same kind of concept? I like, mean, kind of, but it's not as, it's not a muscular process, yeah. but, um, but, but I you, would certainly say, you know, don't, you know, when you go home that evening, don't turn on the sound machine if you can handle it. Like if you sleep with a noisemaker, turn it off. Don't turn, don't sleep with the TV going. Like truly decrease auditory stimulation and give your ears time to rest. You know, with, with working with musicians, you know, doing my training in Nashville um, and musicians come off the stage and their ears are just ringing and it's hard to sleep and it's counterintuitive because what you want to do is then play the noise or give the distraction you know, techniques. Um, and part of the issues is they then get on their tour bus, which is loud. Um, and they're trying to sleep and they're not giving their ears that time to recover. So, um, you know, it's like get into as quiet of a place as you can and, and give it some time, kind of suffer through that ringing and let it pass. And then, and hopefully it'll, you'll get as good of recovery as you can. Yeah. So I also just got to thinking, well, you guys were just down in Orlando, right? Yeah. And I was like, oh, like going to the amusement park and riding roller coasters all day. Yeah. Oh, that's probably about that. very damaging as well, right? Like, well, there's then, a whole new vertical you just opened up. <laughs> man, <laughs> like, man, carnivals. Yeah. Everyone's screaming the loud noise Seriously. of the roller coaster. That's uh-huh. probably not you know too what? great all we, day. We were at Disney recently with the kids and those, the rides and, uh, it is incredibly loud. Yeah. Um, so for those of you with uh, Disney or theme parks <laughs> connections, hit me Protect up because yours. we could totally get something onto these, the, the people that are working the rides. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, and I would be very interested to know, like, how long is their shift on that particular ride? Because we could calculate a noise dose. I'm sure they work with OSHA and, like, have regulations. But um, sometimes they just aren't taken seriously enough yeah. by mm-hmm. the employees. And... Um, because noise is cumulative, you know, NIOSH is the agency nationally that does the research and makes suggestions about how much noise is acceptable. Their, their criteria is a little more stringent than the actual regulation agency, which is OSHA. And the issue I have with both of those regulatory systems is that they're calculating how much noise is permissible during an eight-hour workday. Noise exists before and after your eight-hour work exactly. day. So when you go home and mow the yard or go to a concert or music or even a loud restaurant that night, that's still contributing to your daily noise dose. So that's where kind of the letting your ears rest in between yeah. is very Gosh. important. It's like I, I mow the lawn. I, I don't put, like I didn't even think, like I haven't thought of putting hearing protection mm-hmm. in yeah. mowing the lawn. Really? But you just, nothing? Like not even, like do you listen to music or you just... No. When you mow the lawn, just, just, mow the just, lawn. just the blades hitting the <laughs> ground. <laughs> really, just when the we're, with my thoughts. <laughs> when we're calculating that daily permissible dose of noise for you, we not only need to look at the loud blast of shooting with a muzzle blade, how, how many number of times, but we also need to look at how, you know, if you have a moderately loud lawnmower that you go home and use and then you're streaming music at what volume it might not be allowed impulse instantaneous damage potential but it's still contributing to how much you're taxing that system yeah. over the course of a day i kind of going back to that recovery thing it like the example that i think of is i used to film waterfowl hunts and, mm-hmm. and i was in uh, arkansas we were there three days filming a duck hunt and it was like all day guns going off we're in a blind you know we're in a spot like about like what we're in guys are shooting yeah um you know, we'd only hunt maybe like three, four hours, mornings, evenings, whatever, but then come back to the place where we were staying, headphones in, editing footage, like listening to all that stuff, music on. Mm-hmm. And it was after that trip that I really started, that was like December and it was right before like late seat, like late muzzleloader season mm-hmm. kind of kicked off. So I went from, um, you know, being in this blind for three days, a lot of shooting to then sitting in a deer stand for like three days in a row. So like polar opposite, like, right middle of December, quiet as can be like blanketed snow. And that was the, like, that was like my aha moment where I knew I'm like, holy crap, something happened on that trip because I'm sitting there and literally could just hear nothing but ringing. And that lasted for, I mean, like I said, like three days of that, of that deer hunt. And thankfully it kind of came back. Like, I don't have like what you described, but definitely like 
I, I know exactly what you're talking about because yeah. that, that's what was going on for those like three ish days. Yeah. So, well, and I'll also say about the ringing, just cause there's probably a lot of people listening to this that struggle with it. Cause it's very pervasive. Um, so with the ringing, uh, you may notice during times of high stress when you're not sleeping well, too much caffeine, alcohol, all of those things can make it really spike. <laughs> Because so every day. <laughs> so yeah. every day. So your your limbic system or really your like emotional regulatory system in your brain has a natural gating system. Sure. That that um that can work to try to suppress the sound of the, the ringing for you. But that's why also if you sit there and really think about can I hear it? Can I hear it? Can I hear it? If you, you can tune into your ringing. Like if, if if for many of us if we get in a quiet place and really think about think about the ringing we can hear it Mm -hmm. and and there's a focus and attention and that's all a a brain process and so uh we can counteract that by getting enough quality sleep trying to decrease stress lay off the caffeine you can see how all those things can create a spiral that makes the ringing absolutely debilitating um, and intrusive in your life so um there's no cure for it but like there's one product, an electronic hearing protection product that um, is the one you have, Haley, mm-hmm. the Sound Gear Phantom. And because it's built on a on a hearing aid chip, one of the options you can do on on your phone controls is you can pipe in different background sounds. And I encourage people to find if they struggle with with ringing and they're wanting to use that as like a masking, then you just find the the sound that best matches what you hear and then find the very lowest volume that'll do the trick to get your mind off of it. Because then when you can remove your focus and attention from it, it lessens in its perception. Yeah. Interesting. I do find like if there are times, like you said, if like if it's at night and it's really quiet and that ring, like I sometimes like I'll find myself focusing on it because I can like, I guess, quotation mark hear it oh right, yeah, you can for sure. um, you can but then i'm like i almost have to be like okay like i have to like n- intentionally like not focus on it and yes. i'm generally yeah. able to do that like just i'm like okay just ignore it like you know whatever but um right there's a there's a whole psychology aspect to it but it really is um you know it is happening we can see that your auditory cortex is lighting up for the ringing on a functional mri machine which wow. can be very uh, validating for people because they're like, what is this sound in my head? Like, is this just in my head? You know, um, am I going crazy? <laughs> and you're not like, it's truly a, an auditory signal that yeah. your brain is generating. Okay. What were you going to say? Eric? I, well, I, where I was going to go on this might actually be where you're kind of headed. So you kind of touched on how it's obviously so connected to the, the brain and the, and you know, perceived sound over time. Am I going crazy? All that stuff. Mm-hmm. I know there's like some study data out there about hearing loss as it relates to dementia. That is where I was going. Oh, Mark, yeah. Man, this is you guys same are on the wavelength. same wavelength. Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess I'll start with kind of timeline wise, what I started seeing in clinic that piqued my interest on the topic. So as I started working with older adults and would often see people who had a diagnosis in their medical record of some form of dementia and hearing loss, um, oftentimes those people would be frustrated with that diagnosis. It's like they hadn't reconciled that they actually had dementia. What um, what age, real quick? I know you said older adults. Like what kind of range... Oh, I mean, anybody from their, somebody in their 60s that had some kind of an sure. early onset diagnosis okay. all the way up to people, you know, in their 90s, Got I it. would say. Okay. You trying to diagnose me, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> but no. one thing I saw, like oftentimes people that have been diagnosed with dementia are in some sort of denial about it. Um, and they'll deny that they have it. And, and, you know, something you see a lot of times is kind of this aggression and paranoia that goes along with it. Yeah. Um. Those things also go along with hearing loss. Yeah. Um, so some of those outward kind of uh, social traits that you start to see can also be seen with people who are struggling to hear. That isolation or the withdrawal socially, um, you can imagine. Uh, and then just the frustration. So sometimes I saw it firsthand in clinic where someone had this, this diagnosis of maybe a mild cognitive impairment. 
and then we get them into some very appropriately fit at, like at their prescription level hearing aids so they're getting the amplification and they had been diagnosed by using testing tools that are delivered verbally now a lot of these tests that you use as screeners for cognitive impairment will go down um, kind of a list of things. They'll say, okay, remember these, these three words. And then you'll do the rest of the test, and then you'll ask, what were those three words? Well, you can imagine with somebody with hearing loss how much more difficult. You're not going to be able to remember something you didn't hear clearly yeah. in the first place. So people might get reclassified to a less severe category of dementia yeah. when they could just hear the test. Yeah. So that really got my attention. And um, that was some really rewarding work when patients would come back to me and be so thankful because their family had written them off as having some horrible dementia. And so much of their problem was related to just not being able to hear. So that was that was very rewarding work. So then I start digging into the literature. And at that time, there was a lot of work coming out of Johns Hopkins and the University of Colorado in particular that was um, looking at the, the onset of cognitive decline, the rate of cognitive decline, um, and the prevalence, and they were correlating things to the degree of untreated hearing loss. So we were seeing where the, um, I believe it was the Johns Hopkins study that showed that people with severe untreated hearing loss were shown to be diagnosed 3.2 years sooner than a normal hearing control with some form of cognitive impairment, and then the degree of untreated hearing loss. So how much hearing loss was going untreated in the brain that's not being stimulated um, th th with the rate of decline. So with a severe case of untreated hearing loss with that unstimulated brain activity, they were showing five times the speed of the rate of decline for dementia. Then um, they were also looking at how the frontal lobe is engaged so much more when you're trying to understand what's being said in the moment. So if we're in a noisy room and I'm really having trouble hearing you and I am having to focus in, I'm reading your lips, we're at a, we're at a party, we're at a wedding reception, I am so focused on trying to understand what the heck you're saying, I am much less likely to be able to recall that information later. Interesting. Oh, because even you're, though you're more focused. Probably oh, because, because you're, you're having to focus yeah. so hard, it's not like locking into your memory. Sure. So you're less like, we call that cognitive reserve. There's less cognitive reserve left over for recalling yeah. that information yeah. later. Like I'm just, f I'm focusing on just hearing, hearing. Right. not listening. listening so yes. you're not, you're, you're, you're not likely to be able to recall information correctly and accurately that you couldn't hear well the first time, yep. like in that screening test. But then neurologically, we know that when your frontal lobe is engaged in this like very intense trying to figure out what you're saying in the moment, we know that there's just less room to be able to recall that information later. So that's kind of this, this, this taxing of your executive function. Uh, at the same time, we see what we call cross-modal plasticity, which is where you can put somebody into a functional MRI, and Colorado, University of Colorado was doing this, where they would put some kind of a visual stimulus with somebody, and then you, they would start to see areas of what should have been processing sound is starting to process visual. It's like, well, how is that happening? Well, it's because our brains are really cool. And if you're not using the part that's designated to be used for what it's used for, it's going to figure out another way to use that space. Interesting. And so... Well, and then um, are you like compensating? Like you said, you're like, um, instead of like, uh, maybe I can't hear, but now I'm trying to read your lips. So is that mm -hmm. like, is that what's happening there? Like your other senses are compensating uh, for that lack of... That would be a good way to put it. Yes. I mean, because your other sensory systems are in overdrive. Sure. Um, especially with visual, you're using a lot more visual cues to then process sound when you're lip reading um, but the moral of the story is your brain is kind of rewiring and reorganizing depending on what sensory information it has to work with to try to give you the best of what's available you know I mean I can't imagine being able to have the the sensory ability in my fingertips to read braille I was just going to bring this oh, up gosh. yeah you yeah. know um, I also can't imagine having the hearing acuity that uh, someone who is blind would have when they're walking down the street and they're so reliant on 
and they're so tuned into the footsteps around them that you and I are not paying attention to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, just think about that in terms of the way your brain reorganizes. And I, I would use those facets in research to talk to my patients who were having trouble adopting their hearing aid technology. Because let's be honest, okay, let's ju- we'll talk about your hearing test in a minute, but let's just say you get to the point where you're ready to wear some hearing aids day to day because maybe you you want to improve your communication. Maybe after this conversation, you just want to make sure your brain is stimulated appropriately. Mm-hmm. Um, but for either one of those ways, when you first put on hearing aids, we use different prescriptive formulas to tell us Um, how loud we need to program certain pitches to restore. Now, your perception is going to be that it sounds awful because you're not used to it. You've gotten used to the way things sound through the filter of your hearing loss. So when we come in and objectively say that in order to give you back the appropriate stimulation, we need to meet your prescriptive targets, um, that we have to do that objectively. And we put these little probe microphones deep down in your ear canal, and then we put the hearing aids on, and we make real-time measurements at each pitch while we're programming your hearing aids to your hearing loss. And so in doing so, you can imagine it then is going to take your brain, research tells us, up to 90 days of wearing that hearing technology day in, day out to put that stimulation back to your auditory cortex the way it was designed to, and then your brain is going to reorganize to then get those connections back in place to process what it's supposed to be processing. So when you first put on hearing aids and you've had hearing loss for a while, everything is going to come in as as noisy. It's hard to tune in in background noise because your brain doesn't know what's important, what it needs to focus on. Um, But that's a learned, it's like physical therapy for your ears. You know, you can't go to physical therapy after an injury once a month and expect to be able to regain function of that that body part you know so you have to wear hearing aids consistently day in day out and get over that hump you know people need this great pep talk uh because because that's what it requires and it's all because your brain then has to readjust back to the way it once was to process the sound yeah I mean, it makes sense because, like, you're hearing, I'm sure, like, you're slowly losing it. And you might not realize what you can't hear, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not like just one day, all of a sudden, it's, like, gone. Right. I mean, think about when you're in a dark movie theater and you go see a movie, like, during the day. And then you walk back out into the bright sun. Mm -hmm. And it's like, whoa, it was not this bright when I walked in there. But, you know, it's just, you know, you're turning the lights on, in a sense. right. And you got to get used to it. Mm -hmm. Well, and and you hit on a question that I was going to ask was, like, you know, with... You know, not on. We can check the results. I feel like uh, this is one of those. Uh, hey, we're, we're one it's of those, a cliffhanger. One of we those got, ads that yeah. you get that you never like. You watch for twenty minutes and like. <laughs> and next, we're going to talk about the whatever. But um, <laughs> and we're still not talking about it. Um, but like, I didn't realize that I wasn't stimulating a portion of my brain that is actively apparently telling me I need to be stimulated or I want to or that's what I'm seeking. So. I was going to ask, well, my question was originally, like, should I periodically get some sort of hearing aid so I can, you know, stim- like, cause, honestly, like, I don't want to wear a hearing aid all the sure. time. And, and, and we'll look at the test results in a minute <laughs> and maybe we'll find out if I need them. But um, that's what I was going to say. Could you periodically do that and like, oh, yeah, let's stimulate the brain a little bit and then off we go. But it sounds like if you're going to wear them, you should consistent. wear them. It needs to be consistent. If you want to get, um, if you want to get benefit out of them. Um, and you really want to get those neural processes reorganized yeah. back to the way they were were when you were created, uh, then yeah, it's a consistent thing. But, but there's so be- many options. I mean, of course, I, here I am talking about hearing aids. I, for all the listeners out there, Odo Pro does not dispense hearing aids. Sure. You heard me talk about those little microphone measurements in real time. There's a lot of equipment that needs to be used. Um, there are uh, certain ways of doing things with best practices with hearing aids that's far more than what I'm able to do providing these this service delivery model p- for protection. So what I'm doing there, and for any audiologist who happen to be listening to this, I, um, I, I truly want to elevate the field of audiology in the mind of the consumer such that we are seen as the gatekeepers to hearing health care. And I want to send people, we have over 160 clinic locations nationwide where the only thing we have in place with these clinics is an agreement that we can refer patients to them. We can set up these appointments. You pay that clinic for their services. It's not like they're employed by me in any way, but they know ex- they, they adhere to our standards of making those ear mold impressions. And then I feel very strongly that 
people should go ahead and get their baseline hearing test while they're in that clinic. You're there. You might as well see where you stand officially with a full diagnostic test in a sound booth. And then um, you have that local point of care yeah. going forward so that if you notice a sudden change in your hearing or if there's suddenly a ringing that changes in the way it sounds or it suddenly doesn't go away, you already have a relationship with a local provider that we've vetted for you. So that's very important. If you're seeking hearing aid technology day to day, which I am a very strong proponent of, um, you need to ha- that needs to be a local point of contact because of that relationship that I was describing that I used to have with my clients. You- you've got to have a good working relationship with that person because it's so individualized and it is a process. Yeah. 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 Have you had customers get your products, but then that's almost a catalyst for them to be like, okay, maybe I do need to get a hearing aid. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of what truly my, my career mission, you know, what started as this little side hustle for my friends and my family has turned into this whole, this kind of career crusade that I'm on to help people get out in front of the problem and, and to make hearing healthcare something that's proactive instead of reactive, where we're getting out in front of it. Um, it's, it's more like a wellness checkup instead of like something you wait until you're in dire straits. I mean, research tells us people wait an average of seven to 10 years from the time they notice that they have a legitimate hearing problem to when they actually seek some help about it. That's a long time. And that's a long time for the brain to be reorganizing, for things to be happening, for it to be impacting your life. The longer you wait, the longer it's going to take to acclimate to those hearing devices once you have them. And it, and it is so largely preventable. So part of what I'm trying to do in the mind of the public is to say, you know, let's not only get you into some good products. And I would love to sell those to you so that I can have a sustainable business. Yeah. <laughs> but also, even more than that, it's to get people to qualified hearing care clinics. You know, I don't send people to Costco. I don't send people to Sam's. I I love Costco. There's one right close to my house. Um, But I I don't like sending people um, to places that don't adhere to what I consider best practices. Yep. Mm -hmm. For sure. Makes total sense. Yeah. So let's, uh, let, let's, oh, I yeah, let's, okay, well, let's, let's get into Ooh. that, but I have two more questions okay. before. Mark, that's more than two. Yeah. How long do we have? Obviously yeah. I can talk about this yeah. all yeah. day. <laughs> you know what? There's so many places we could go with this conversation, dementia, tinnitus, how yeah. we hear, hearing damage, and then, oh, by the way, hearing protection. There's lots of options. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the one thing I was just going to add or just contribute to what you said is like, it's easy to ignore, or at least for even for me, like whatever, like you you're like, well, yeah, I can't hear as good, big deal. But the education standpoint of, oh, this could be contributing to cognitive decline, mm-hmm. like that's a pretty, bi- that's a little bit greater than yeah. just like, yeah, I didn't get to hear the bird today. You know, yeah. like that connection um, is uh, is pretty huge there. So, okay, well, let's just, we'll get to the test. Yeah. With the, I took a hearing test today, like we talked about, on uh, Grace's uh, iPhone hearing test machine. And I can, I can text it to you so that when you go get your full true baseline hearing test at a local practice, you can compare this to it. So I'll send it to you. But, you know, what we're seeing on your hearing test is you hear the bass tones. You hear low pitch sounds, bass tones very well, exceptionally well. I mean, at the better end of the normal hearing range, you can hear those pitches. Um, And then your right ear, we'll talk about your right ear first. Your right ear then slopes down and gets into at the highest pitches, 10,000 hertz, and up, you get into the mild hearing loss range. Now, the good news for your right ear is that the speech frequencies are primarily between 500 and 4,000 hertz, four to 6,000 hertz, okay? So, um, you know, your, your right ear, you're still hearing the, the speech sounds within the normal range. Now, some of the harmonics above that, which if there's music musicians listening and you understand harmonics, you're missing some of the harmonics of the higher, you know, but the bass, the fundamental pitches you're hearing within the normal range. That's great news. Your your left ear is a bit of a different story because you're a right-handed shooter. And so it's kind of a trademark. I would look at this and be like, oh, this is a guy that's been shooting right-handed for a while. Mm-hmm. And I bet your ringing is concentrated but at about 5,000 hertz. I bet if I was able to play a 5,000 hertz pure tone, it would sound strangely similar to the ringing that you hear because that's the most severe dip. Yep. 
on the hearing test. So you hear from 250 hertz, which is a very low boom. Mm-hmm. Did you like yeah, that? I, <laughs> that was very really no, good. good. <laughs> yeah, baritone. I can hear that. Very yeah. Um, I haven't done vocal exercises yeah. in many years, but I've kind of impressed myself. All right. So 250 hertz, you hear excellent. All the way up to really 3,000 hertz, you hear very well. 3,000 hertz is a very critical speech frequency. There's a lot of speech sounds that happen right there at that pitch. That's good. Problem is, then you take like a nosedive. And you get down to a moderate, what I would consider a moderate level of hearing loss for the pitches of 4,000 hertz and above. So... Um, that's where the ringing is coming from. Yeah. And, and oftentimes I would see the ringing be more severe when there's an asymmetry like this. When, you're right, when your right ear is hearing really well and your left ear has this, this uh, dive here, uh, you can imagine your brain, because you have a healthy system on one side, it's like, wait, why is this uneven? What's happening? And so, bing, you get the ringing. And it's probably at about, bing. Could you hear Mark that? can't that hear is, me as yeah, well. Yeah. No, that, that was very that was pretty darn close. I mean, like it's like that is it. I mean, yeah, we're looking at, you know, I don't maybe we could even take a picture of that or something. But yeah, like, we'll it, post yeah, it on we the can post screen it. for it sure. It's just um, like pl- like it's like da, 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 and then just like it plummets. It plummets. Um and so, you know, like I say, this is not a diagnostic test. This is a hearing screening that's built into a headset that I would actually love to tell people about. It's yeah, really cool. Yeah. But uh but this yeah, I mean this is kind of a trademark thing. Um, and so, yeah, when and if you're ready to wear something day to day, uh, I do think that you would see some improvement in the speech frequencies, um, particularly if we could improve in that left ear, the 5,000 to 8,000 hertz pitches. Um, so with this type of a hearing loss, we would be leaving your ear really open. So, uh, probably one of those styles you see where there's a teeny tiny piece that sits behind your ear and then it looks like a little piece of fishing line that comes down Mm -hmm. and then there's a little ear tip that goes in your ear, non-custom, but because we want to leave your ear as open as possible because those low pitch sounds, you want to leave those natural. You want those to just come in as they naturally would. We don't want to mess with those. And then we would use, we would use our programming to only amplify those pitches we're at each pitch where you need them. Because I'd imagine there's value in getting natural, like organic tones still coming in, right? Oh, yeah. It's just going to sound more natural. It's going to yeah. feel more natural. Okay. And then at the opposite with protection, I want a perfect acoustic seal. I want to completely plug your ear so that anything that hits your eardrum either has to pass through this microphone system to regulate it or through a filter to regulate it. And maybe I mean, that's what was so crazy about those ear molds. I mean, like you said, that's a custom. Everybody's ear is different. Mm-hmm. And when you could feel that, a scientific word for it, the goo, go into your ear. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, uh, yeah. it seals. It so, seals. But you could still hear a little right, bit. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, let's what, talk about that. Yeah. yeah. If I want to guarantee that you're not going to get any hearing loss, I need to put you in a full bubble suit because the bones of your body transduce sound. I could put a bone oscillator on your teeth and you'd be able to hear it. Oof. I'm not kidding. The uh, you could the, the cochlea, that snail shell, is just a few millimeters behind the... the underneath the mastoid bone, which is right behind your ear. And your bones are really good sound transducers. We can put a bone oscillator on your toe and play a sound and you could hear it. Holy cow. Truly. So, because the, the bones of your body transduce the sound. So, by plugging your ears and blocking off your ear canals completely, yep. um, that's just one transducer. So we can really only, like a noise, re- we can talk about noise reduction ratings versus impulse peak insertion loss, different rating systems, but the noise reduction rating is the most widely used. So realistically speaking, by blocking your ears canals, you're, you can only get up to 27, 28 decibels of noise reduction. So if you see an earplug that advertises 30 plus decibels of NRR, that's some real slick marketing. I'd love to see the white papers on that. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that said, the best thing to do if you're at a range or if you're shooting a muzzle break or if you're at an indoor range is to have something that completely seals your ear canal with a muff on top of it. That's going to get you up to 50 decibels of noise reduction. Okay. But I would need to put like a, a, a helmet would be even better, you know, because the bones of your skull are transducing the sound as well. Yeah. What, what is like the, like how many decibels would can be considered like damaging? Well, it depends on how long you're exposed to it. So the typical rule is 85 decibels over an eight-hour workday is permissible. 
Okay. A gunshot is 160 and considered to, or 140 to 160, which on the regulatory charts is considered instantaneously damaging. What would be an example of a sound that you would think would be like benign, not damaging, but people would might be exposed to a lot, and then that could be create a hair okay. dryer. Okay. In a hair salon. For people oh. that work in a hair salon, a hair dryer that's running at 70, 75 decibels yeah. to the point that you have to raise your voice a little bit, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. I don't know how much time you spend in a hair salon. None, but when actually. I'm, but <laughs> when I'm, your hair. Haley, <laughs> Haley, you and I can talk yes. about this. <laughs> so when you go that. to the hair salon and they're, and they're drying your hair with a hair dryer, you have yeah. to raise your voice a little bit to mm-hmm. be heard. Conversational speech is usually around 60 to 65 decibels. So you know if you're having to raise your voice to be heard, then it's whatever the sound is, is a little louder than that. So that's kind of a rule of thumb that you can relate back to. Okay. Uh, so I'm guessing a hair dryer is going to be more like 70, 75 decibels. Okay. Well, for people that are exposed to that day in, day out, that's going to add up over time. Because yeah. even though that's permissible under OSHA guidelines over an eight-hour workday, because they permit up to 85 decibels, that person, that person in the salon is exposed to a lot of noise outside of that salon. Yeah. So that would be an example. Gotcha. Gotcha. I know like when my wife's blow drying her hair, like I actually have to leave the bathroom because I'm just like, it's like I find it actually uncomfortable. It well, is loud. And that's interesting because your tolerance of noise decreases as you develop hearing loss. There we go. You would think it would make you less bothered. Yep. Right. Yeah. More because immune Because you to have it. hearing loss. But we see that your we measure a loudness discomfort level and your loudness discomfort level gets lower. So you hit that point of pain sooner. Like to so certain, so for most people pitches? we would see like for a, for a normal hearing person um, speech at about 100 decibels you start to cringe. Like it's it's uncomfortably loud. It hurts, okay? But for somebody with hearing loss, you might hit that uncomfortable level at like 90. 95. Okay. It's almost uh, like having like an open wound in a way. Well, that's yeah. another way where programming hearing aids gets tricky, which is why I want to send people to really credentialed people who know what they're doing because that window that we're trying to fit sound into, we have to use a lot of compression and amplification because we're trying to make things audible. We have to make it louder to make it audible, but then we got to get it where it's not uncomfortable. So uh, that's, that's where it's really hard sometimes to make hearing aids sound natural. Because we're trying to compress everything into a very small envelope of volume. Interesting. That was another one. Like, how how accurately can you duplicate getting somebody back to what would be considered quotation mark normal hearing with a we, hearing aid? We can get the, um, for somebody with, with hearing loss that's up, up to the severe la- range, like 70, 75, 80 decibels across the board, if that's your threshold of hearing, we can put you in some powerful hearing aids to get you audibility but it's not just stimulation at that point um there's other things that have started to break down at that point so sometimes you know you're you're still having to practice some other communication strategies for face-to-face communication to go along with that and then once you get into that severe range and beyond we start talking about cochlear implants And that's where we can go in, even with adults, we go in and we can put that electrode array where your hair cells used to be that are damaged beyond repair. And um, and then we start stimulating electronically, which requires a lot of physical therapy for your ears that we call oral rehabilitation, where you do all these listening exercises and you kind of have you have to learn to hear and make use of sound through an electric signal versus an auditory signal. So I kind of had a question about that. So let's say it was Mark as an example again, like if he decided to wear some sort of hearing aid um, day in and day out for Mm -hmm. like, I don't know, let's just say 10 years, Mm -hmm. like kind of like physical therapy, like, yeah, you might get better. Could he get to the point where it's like after 10 years, he takes them out and his hearing's like, no, you can't because the the, damage is already done. The hair cells are are done okay we can't bring those back there's some yeah. stem cell therapy and okay. things going on in animals that where we're trying to figure out how to actually hmm. recover those hair cells keep me posted but <laughs> i'll keep you posted but what we're doing uh, with that day in day out wear is training your brain okay yeah so um kind of like sun damage i mean it's, you can't really you reverse can't reverse it. it yeah you can't reverse it yeah yeah that was my question too i mean it's one of those things like it, it reiterates the importance of getting ahead of it mm-hmm. early Rather than waiting until, you know... Prevention is everything. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then stabilizing where you are so that it doesn't continue to get worse. Yeah. Um, 
because you, like you say, you don't want to wear hearing aids every day. You're getting by fine with your daily communication without them right now, other than I'm sure the daily, you know, just kind of minor annoyances. I bet when you go to a restaurant, it's harder for you to understand speech and noise. Oh, totally. Like, yeah, a, cr- a crowded setting is definitely difficult. And the problem with that, too, I would imagine, and I know this happens for me sometimes, like, you just kind of give up. You're like, yeah, mm-hmm. oh, I'm just not going to be part of this conversation. Yeah. Or oh. do what my so dad then, does, and you just, yeah. yeah. And they could be saying anything, and you're like, yeah, yeah. sure. And yeah. see, it's like, like you do to kids when Miss, they don't understand. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> Miss Chatterbox nickname over here, you know, um, that breaks my heart. I know. To see mm-hmm. people not exactly. engaging. I mean, my favorite thing to do is to pack out our dining room table with friends shoulder to shoulder squeezed in, and everybody's talking and laughing. There's music. Exactly. And to, to sit there and be nodding and smiling and not, not able good. to engage with that is heartbreaking to me. Because that brings me so much fulfillment and joy and enriches my life so much. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I want to help people regain that or maintain that. Yeah. Well, and also you're not getting that stimulation from the conversation, like I would imagine, Yeah. you know. Yeah. um, And that causes you to kind of withdraw socially. That That's what I was going to say. So we do see links with depression. Okay. Um, there's, There's just... Yeah, it can lead to a host of other things because then then you start to see other, you know, your your lifestyle starts to get impacted because you you withdraw. Right. Uh which leads to a bunch of other issues. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My, my my grandma is she's 89 and she's the same way. Like she, you know, doesn't like talking on the phone, mm-hmm. you know, because she'd much rather prefer email because she can read and, and get thoughts across that way. Yeah. Whereas like that direct, "Hey, pick up the phone, have a conversation." You know, and, Can you and it's fa- sad. Does she FaceTime? Can you FaceTime with her? So does that help? Yes, lip reading is something that that definitely helps. Mm-hmm. The hardest thing for her is like just a regular phone call because you don't have that context, and you know, it's it's uh, yeah, you you start to see that withdrawal, mm-hmm. I guess, a little mm-hmm. bit. You know, and that's it's sad. Yeah. So, but again, that reiterates getting ahead of this stuff, get, get which ahead is of why it, we're having know. this conversation. And I, and I guess, like you know, you'd say it's a generational thing, which it is, right? But so you have a generation of people that probably didn't take care of their ears, like yep. they, you know, should have, or maybe even could have because of resources, right? But it's like, okay, you know, don't don't be me. You know what right. I mean? We have these amazing options mm-hmm. now that 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 aren't uh, a hindrance. Mm-hmm. They're not, you know, um, going to interfere. Right. And, and so it's just it's just a really cool thing um, that that's available right now. I did want to. You mentioned something yesterday that I th- found like really interesting, mm-hmm. and it was you uh, brought up the example of a dentist drill, which is yeah. just like, in my opinion, not yeah. a great sound to begin with. But um, like people essentially almost like carving out. And I guess we've been talking about it, but not within this context, like just a very specific tone mm-hmm. of their hearing loss. Mm-hmm. Maybe talk about that the, a little bit. The, um, the hand piece, as I've learned that a lot of dentists call it a hand piece. I've just always called it a dental drill. You know, you think about that. Whee, yep, equipment. No, exactly. and it is almost a, <laughs> it's, it's almost a pure tone. Yeah. It's a high pitch and it's very focused and concentrated at that pitch. So that is damaging to some very discreet, section of hair cells on your cochlea. So um, with that, when I was in clinic, I would often see people come in and their only complaint was ringing in the ears. And these dentists would come in and I would test their hearing and their hearing on this graph would look great. Everything's well into the normal range as it should be. And then both ears, whoop, right at that pitch where the dental drill is. And that's where the ringing is spiked because of all, it's great. We've already had our education lesson. So you understand what I'm talking yeah. about. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that gets really tricky. Um, but what I've been able to do is find a filter that we can build into a small, like, I know you guys that are listening can't see, but I'm holding up a small, it fits in the canal of your ear instead mm-hmm. of filling up the whole sure. puncha bowl of your ear. And then this little filter in here, I have one that can, target the pitch of that drill so that when at a certain loudness level um so when you you turn on that drill you're able to talk normally as soon as the drill goes off but when that drill turns on it the it it filters that to protect you from that specific pitch range oh man that is so cool so it's like you're working you're drilling you're not going to be talking to that patient anyway and then boom you shut it off but the idea is that dentist i mean of course i mean 
the lanyard, which I designed because there was not a good lanyard out there for these things. The lanyard that you can have them on, you can take them out of your ears and they could dangle around your neck and they're cinched so they're not going to fall off. But the whole idea is that a dentist could essentially wear these all day long. They can converse and talk normally because the natural, the safe sounds can pass through naturally. And then instantaneously with a non-electronic product, uh, they can filter the unsafe sounds. So that basically is what a filter is. Like a filter is intended to like keep out a certain frequency of yes. sound. Okay. And there are so many different filter technologies out yeah. there and they're not all the same. So, I mean, I am now making a life study of studying um you know, what filters are out there. You know, part of the reason why I am now uh, manufacturing, we're now doing our own Odo Pro line of non-electronic products because I am I am sourcing what I believe to be the best possible filter options. And then we control exactly like what silicone, sure, medical grade we're building these in. And we can get creative with what we need if you need certain things built in. But, but with that, these filters, I mean, there are so many to choose from that do different, type things and accomplish regulating the sound in different ways. And I have found the ones that I can see allowing the most access to safe sound levels with great protection from what you need protection from. And are filters interchangeable? They so are. Like, okay. Yeah, they are interchangeable. <laughs> I know, wow. like it blew Which my is mind. key. So with these, like if a dentist were to order these, yeah. um, they could also get a set of music filters, for example. And then they and then, can go... And then they can go to concerts and the music filters operate a little differently. So instead of being more of an all or nothing, like they either try to let everything pass through and block it, similar to the shooting filter, um, a music filter takes all the sound waves passing through, bass to treble, and shifts that entire frequency spectrum down so it's okay. like turning the overall volume down no matter how soft or loud or high or low pitch it's turning it's taking the edge off and maintaining the fidelity of the music i find that my own voice still sounds boomy a little bit in any of these products even with a filter just because we've destroyed the natural resonance properties of your ear because you're listening through the hole of the small filter like listening through a straw well and honestly like that one was my favorite we've talked about a few times right with concerts and like because you talked about if you put um, like a normal earplug in, mm -hmm. like you're dampening your hear, you, lo you yeah. lose like that sound quality, right? So like that filter was so cool. It's like because a lot of times I'm like, why don't I put an earplug in when I go to a concert? Because then I'm not going to hear the same mm -hmm. music. Whereas with the filters, like that's so cool. It's the same sound, yes. just turned down. Yes. and I would totally wear that. Yeah, to a concert over just an earplug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love. And that all happens non-electronically. Non-electronically. Blows my mind. I know. I don't understand. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, you know, so these, I'm showing you guys on the table, we're looking at the custom fit versions, which, yeah. which as you know, as we've talked about, are ideal because to protect you, I need to make sure that everything that hits your eardrum is regulated through some mechanism to protect you. But I also realize that the price point of a custom fit product is going to keep people from everybody having access to this. And that's something I recognize. So even though it's not my ideal scenario, I've taken the same filter, uh, starting with the shooting version. I've taken that and put it into a non-custom offering that we have just started selling on our site. In fact, the very first shipments are gonna start going out this week. Um, and they pre-sold. <laughs> I sold all my inventory before they even started shipping Good news. out. But we've got another shipment coming um, that's supposed to be coming early September. And so we're already pre-selling for that. But this is a $50 price point with this little keychain canister, which I'm already finding really handy to just have them on my keychain. So it could, maybe there's people who would want a non-custom version just because they are smaller, fit in a keychain canister, and you have them with you all the time. But I put the same shooting filter into multiple sized ear tip sleeves you can choose from. So you find the fit that most ideally occludes your ear canal. Yeah, It's not gonna be as great as a custom, but if you can find a good seal where you feel like, and in, in, you know, ha have someone else look at the side of your ear and see if there's any air leakage around it, find the right size that, um, that is tight and secure and, fit and fits. And then we send you a medium and a large, we can send you an extra small or an extra large if the ones that come with the pack don't fit you. And then if you want later on, you can pay just the price difference. 
to upgrade to just the custom fit sleeve and we'll okay. send you just the sleeve. You can take the filter out of this $50 product and pop it into the custom sleeve. Crazy. So you can upgrade. Yeah. So it gives people that entry level price point and then, um, and then when the time is right for them, if they want to get the custom fit, they can. Yeah. Um, so we've tried to do that and, um, the filters here are interchangeable. So we sell music filters on the website separately. So if you wanted to order a set of music filters to then interchange with the shooting ones, yep. um, and then maybe in the future, if this goes well and people are really receptive to this, we could end up with, um, you know, the music filtered version yeah. that you order at that price point as well. So I mean, the two. cool thing, like what I love about that though, is like the versatility of being able to use you know, the plugs, whichever version you get. Yeah. And essentially like customize it to whatever activity you're gonna be doing. It's like, oh I'm right. gonna be hunting today, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be in the duck pit, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Oh, now I'm gonna go to a concert with Yeah, my and what wife. do those different filters run? Like if I wanted like the shooting filter, but then I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna go see Eric Church this weekend. Like Yeah. I honestly have to look back at my website. I okay. can't remember the price. I think they're sixty five a pair. Yeah. For the music filter. And I mean what you're paying for is the filter. Right. And and the um, fits great on a bino harness. I can Just get the throw that out there. I can get the mm -hmm. impulse filters to people a little more economically than I can the music filters, which are a bit more sophisticated, I sure. guess, to to produce. Um, I don't have the patent on those filters. I'm sourcing them from who I see as doing the very best job at making yeah. these filters. Cool. So um uh, yeah, so the, I believe the music filters are 65 a pair on the site. Uh, so that, that creates kind of a versatile system where, you know, for hunting and shooting, I like the full shell build. So when you go and you see on the website there's an Odo Pro filtered product, yep. you select whether you want that small canal size or the full shell. And then you select which filter you're looking for. And then you choose your colors. And then you head to check out. Gotcha. And then if we have a provider already in your area... Uh, you get an email from us with that provider information. They'll be expecting your phone call. We'll tell you exactly how much that provider charges to mold your ears. And um, and then we send you an order form and a prepaid label to take with you to that appointment so that all you have to do is take that box and drop it in the mail. If we don't already have a provider in your area, then when you check out on the website, it puts you in our queue to source a new, a new provider. And it takes us up to a week to do that usually. Yeah. Um, and then if there's a big group where it's more, because I, when I can fit you in person, I don't charge for the ear mold impressions. So sometimes I'll have a group that says, okay, how many people do we have to get together to, to fly you up here and let you fit everybody? And so if you have enough people, that can be a cost savings because you're not, every person's not paying 50 bucks or whatever it is to go get your ears molded at a clinic. Does that make sense? Makes Obviously. total sense. That makes perfect yeah. sense. Yeah. Which is why I'm getting the goo in my ears at noon. And then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then we continue sourcing what we believe to be other really great products other yeah. than just these that we're now branding ourselves. Like the Sound Gear Phantom is our favorite electronic right now. Um, if you're looking for something that can provide amplification and protection, um, this is now rechargeable where historically they used to just take hearing aid batteries we do still sell a battery operated version if you just prefer that and you don't want Bluetooth, but it's only like a $200 price difference. So it's not really a money saving significantly, but um, these are rechargeable. They're Bluetooth. You can take phone calls, stream music. Oh, nice. I wore them all day flying here yesterday yeah. um, just because they're so comfortable and I can stream and you can flip the external microphones on and off yeah. really quickly and easily if you need to hear something and then shut cool. it right back off. And then like... This product that you just took a hearing test through, mm -hmm. um, this is called the Audera, A-U-D-E-A-R-A. -A -A. And this is a company that I found out of Australia, and um, Odopro is really one of the first to bring it to the U.S. market. It's It looks like it would just be a typical noise-canceling Bluetooth headphone, but the difference is, is it has this integrated hearing test that you just took. Then we can personalize these to be tuned to your hearing profile. Oh, which wow. we'll have to take some time and do that and let you listen to some music yeah. that you know what it typically sounds like to you. Then we can you can listen to it through a personalized headset. So it would then be giving you more left ear high pitch, essentially. Oh, yeah. So his would be um, like louder in the left than the yeah, right? Yeah, so this guy, James oh, Fielding um, in Australia, he developed this product initially after he had been to med school and he was trying to figure out a way to send people in these rural areas of Australia a headset where they could get a hearing test and then send it back. Um, and so in doing that, he then realized, oh wait, we can then personalize and create a really cool 
uh, personal audio products. So this is not marketed as protection, even though it looks like a muff, but it has active noise canceling for, which we can talk about the difference in active noise canceling. It's not good for gunshots. AirPods don't work for gunshots, by the way. Uh, but it has active noise canceling. It has all these um, international plugins. So I've, <laughs> I've had a few clients who are going on like an international hunting trip and they'll get these for the plane ride and they'll have like a good headset they can plug in anywhere in the world. Um, you can hardwire plug in, like if you wanted to use them for a podcast, they yeah. can hardwire for that connection or Bluetooth. And then they come with a TV streamer so that like if your wife likes the TV at a different volume than you do, she can be listening to the TV speakers while you're streaming Bluetooth with a personalized sound profile. Huh, so essentially, the way that this is a protection product, yeah. why Odo Pro carries this product, is not just because of an improved listening experience, but it's also because you can listen at a safer level. Instead of cranking the volume up to be able to hear and understand the speech of the TV show, we can restore the clarity so that you can listen at a safer level. That is awesome. That is very interesting. I have something, Grace, this is not gonna make sense to you, but it, this dawned on me, and I have to bring this up. Please. Mark, on Spaghetti Shoot, are you familiar with the show Ridiculousness? No. Okay. So, Mark is a huge fan. Mark uh, loves Chanel West Coast. Oh. Has a very high-pitched laugh. Mark cannot hear high-pitched noises very well. What so, if Mark doesn't know what Chanel's laugh actually Because we actually had the argument with Jimmy about her, her laugh, and Jimmy's yes. like... So All right. Said, After the podcast, we're going to personalize these headphones and we're going to um, stream. We're going to yeah. let him listen with and without the personalization. Remember that story that we kicked it off where like uh, the the little girl like was able to hear for the first time? That's going to be this. And Mark <laughs> is going to be cry. brought to tears. <laughs> <laughs> TBD on what kind of tears I, these I, are. I thought you were going to bring up the picture when we were bear hunting and I was standing three inches from the TV. Uh, I, I can show you that too. Yeah. But too that's close true. to like, the TV. I mean, <laughs> at home, like to hear the television and what's going on, particularly if there are like, you know, interfering noises, maybe the kids have you yeah. know, their little mm -hmm. iPad devices on or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, I got to crank it. And then yeah. my, wife, my wife's like, can we turn it down, please? I'm like, I can't hear it if yeah. it's not up. Well, and no. I primarily work from home and I have, um, I have three young children, three daughters. And of course, they want to be in the room with me wherever I am. You know, I'm like, you have a you have a room, you have a yard, whatever. And they're like, oh, we want to be in here with you. Well, I have this hooked up to the TV in my office. And so they can be sitting like streaming, watching television while I'm working. And it doesn't bother me. Yeah, don't do this. Don't watch the TV like that. Was that because you couldn't hear? Maybe. Yo, I don't, you know, <laughs> just for the picture, maybe. That well, was part of it. I, I think this set is really great, and it's great for people. Um, uh, you know, I've had people purchase for their parents, like, yeah. you know, older people. But, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm 38 years old. I love this product. Yeah. Um, it's great for travel. It's, you know, a yeah. number of different things. But, yeah. Um, I love it. It's pretty cool. So that's just an example of a cool product we found that's not widely available. When you go to the Aldera website, it says they're shipping in Australia. But you can order it through Odo Pro, and we'll get it to you. Um, so it, it's it's been really cool. And we're constantly talking to companies around the globe and researching and diving into what's available technology-wise. And there's some really exciting things that are in development right now. Um, and so hopefully, you know, things are going to continue coming to market that are cool and new. Uh, right now, there's nothing that really rivals the Phantom when it comes to the bells and whistles you can get in an electronic product. But it will have competition. Super Things cool. are coming. Things are coming. It might take another year. Yeah. Uh, but I am so excited about everything that's coming down the pipeline. Awesome. Well, and we talked about the versatility of just the different filters. You know, that's definitely a multi-purpose. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There, the, Bluetooth, you know? the Bluetooth integrated into this really changed the game. I mean, when I got into this game in 2018, and the best electronics still took a hearing aid battery and had a linear hearing aid circuit yeah. and was just this dated technology. And I'm like, how are we not doing better? And as a as a field, we've been so focused on um, make, paying our bills through hearing aid sales, which is a whole different beef I have with the whole industry, um, but being too reliant on hearing aid sales. Uh, but so when this product was launched in October of 2020, it was a game changer and miles ahead of the competition. And that Bluetooth capability made it multi-purpose. So they don't just live in your shooting bag anymore. Most of my clients leave this charger plugged in on their nightstand, and then they just live on the charger, and they're plugged in, ready to go, yeah. 
whatever you're doing, even a long conference call. I have people who tell me that, um, sure, they wear them for protection, but they also just wear them for really comfortable right. conference calls. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's mm-hmm. more of an everyday thing than just a specialized, right. you know, hunting, shooting type deal. Yes. Right. Which mm-hmm. makes it, I feel like it's like, yes, it comes with a price tag, but it makes it more palatable than Well, too. what price would oh, you put on your more. ears? Well, there you go. And honestly, <laughs> the, this, this set here, you know, retails for a little yeah. over 1500 bucks out the door. Yep. It is nothing to shake a stick at. Exactly. That is a hefty price tag. But if you're in this space and you're researching, some of the competing brands are still selling the battery powered dated circuit for twice that amount. Wow. And people are paying Crazy. for it. Because because all the, I mean, all the public knows to do is to look at the advertising and the marketing collateral. Yeah. Whereas with Odo Pro, we're digging into the specs, the sure. research, the white papers, the circuit, how does it work? Um, at, and then following up with that customer service. So, I mean, sure, you can go to soundgear.com and you can purchase through them, but they they could send you, to, most likely they're going to send you to a clinic that focuses on their hearing aid sales. Yeah. And they may not know squat about how to service this product. Mm-hmm. So the the service portion has a huge value to it. And um and that fifteen hundred dollars I quoted you, that includes our one, I think it's seventy five dollars non refundable fee that's baked in there. And that just covers a fraction of the time we spend with our customers and then the shipping back and forth. So um it's more than worth it right. in my opinion for well, sure and, and hopefully you know if you know if you're smarter like you said get ahead of the game if you can get yourself something like this mm-hmm. you never have to buy the hearing aid exactly. or at least, right. or at least, or at least you can buy yourself some time mm-hmm. yeah. literally mm-hmm. yeah um but before you would need it for mm-hmm. sure yeah. awesome yeah um that that's that's the whole game is is getting people into uh products and getting them aware of the giving them the knowledge they need to protect their hearing in the most realistic way they can understanding you're not going to wear a full body suit when you shoot right so um let's give you the most realistic tools we can to at least delay the problem that's inevitable um i want you to be able to stand front and center at your favorite show I I love sound. I love music. I love communicating. I I have a great adoration and respect for shooting sports, for hunting, and for the conservationist efforts that go right along with it. And I want you to be able to continue doing that. Um, I just want to give you a safer way to go about it. No, I mean, that's totally amazing. And and you really hit on something, even just like enjoying, like I don't go to concerts and or or I don't like to go to a bar with live music. But, well, excuse me. I like to do those things, but I choose not to do those things because I don't want to, you know, damage my hearing. Yeah. So it's almost like, you know, you, you could allow somebody to get back into something that they used to that enjoy. That they once enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That enriches their lives so that you can engage in that conversation around the yep. dinner table or around the campfire at the end of a great hunt when everybody's talking. Exactly. Um, you know, I mean, those are life enriching experiences and you can't put a value on it you cannot put a value on that no yeah did we miss anything grace i mean actually we did because i i still have more questions i'm just not going to ask them we've covered so much and obviously i mean this is this has just been the most fun surprise of a business i mean don't get me wrong i've i've worked my tail off uh to to grow this thing but it is truly a passion project and like i say i i can only hope and pray that my children find something that they are as passionate about to spend their life doing because this doesn't feel like work to me that's awesome this is this is great fun and um you know as as we continue to grow uh hopefully we will leave a legacy with odo pro that we brought this into the conversation awesome well, I'd say that passion definitely shows. It does. Like it mm-hmm. comes is, right through for sure. Very, thank very you. apparent. So, well, Grace, thank you so much for this priceless information to help us and everybody else protect one of our priceless senses. Hopefully, everybody learned something. I know I learned a ton. Yep. And, uh, yeah, if you're looking to preserve and protect your hearing, which you should be, Go check out Otopro, otoprotechnologies.com. Mm-hmm. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. This was fun. It was fun. Yeah. Super fun. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks I for love listening. It. We'll catch you on the next one. <laughs> bye. All right, bye. Bye.
There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.